Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick Lewis. For those who don't know me, I am the uh, president of the Cleveland chapter, Lawyers Chapter of the Federal Society. Uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Um, this afternoon's panel, a View from the Bench, newly confirmed judges share their perspectives. Um, we have the, the great pleasure of having all three of the United States District Judges that were uh, uh, nominated by President Trump and confirmed by the United States Senate in 2020. Um, and uh, we're grateful they were able to come join us uh, and speak about the, their uh, perspectives as, as newly appointed judges and um, you know, for everything from their confirmation process to their transition to, to some of the things they've, they've seen from practitioners that, that they like and, and maybe some, some of those tips that uh, President Abhoff was referring to earlier. Um, moderating our panel today is the Honorable Eric Murphy, Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Um, he's fairly new to the bench himself, having been uh, joining the court in 2019. Uh, previously, uh, Judge Murphy served as the ninth state solicitor of Ohio, appointed to that position by Attorney General, now Governor Mike DeWine, and continuing that service um, under Attorney General Dave Yost. As state solicitor, uh, Judge Murphy, in that role, briefed and argued appellate cases on behalf of the state and its agencies and officers in the United States Supreme Court in the Sixth Circuit, where he now uh, is a member, and before the Supreme Court of Ohio. Um, before being state solicitor, Judge Murphy practiced corporate and appellate litigation at Jones Day. Um, in Columbus, uh, even receiving recognition as litigator of the week by the American lawyer. Um, and after graduation from law school, Judge Murphy served as a clerk to Justice uh, Anthony Kennedy, the Supreme Court of the United States, and Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson of the Fourth Circuit. Judge Murphy, thank yeah, you. Thank you, happy to be here. Thanks everybody, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's surreal uh, looking out at a full audience. I haven't done anything like this in I don't know how long. Um, too many Zoom. Um, meetings where it's just very awkward. I'm talking in and I don't see anything other than my face and I just keep talking. So it's nice to see other people's faces instead of my own when I, when I talk. But uh, uh, so uh, it's uh, great here, number one, to be at the Federal Society. I, um, it's gonna be a, a difficult task to, to follow uh, Judge Brown's uh, moving speech, but we'll do our best with the nuts and bolts of federal discovery and uh, uh, <laughs> other, other practical pointers. <clears throat> Um, I would start off by saying, you know, it's been two years uh, since I've been a circuit judge, and um, I've told lots of people this. The one thing that I get frustrated by is um, the fact that I don't get to spend enough time uh, with each case. Uh, we just our docket size on the Sixth Circuit um, uh, requires me to, you know, about a, uh, a week with my own opinions, and not just with the majority opinions, whereas when I was briefing a case at the Supreme Court or something, I would take a uh, month or so. So um, I've been somewhat frustrated by kind of just the ability to keep up with the cases. But I'm here, I'm, I, I, I don't think any of the three judges here are going to find much uh, sympathy for me because their dockets are about three times, as, four times as big as my uh, a circuit, a circuit court's docket. So every time I see a district judge, I, I thank them for uh, the tremendous, tr tremendous amount of work that they have to do. So I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna briefly um, introduce the three judges without getting into their backgrounds because I'll, that'll be actually the first question I ask them. I'll go in order of seniority as uh, Judge Reed or wherever he is in the audience. He likes to tell me that he's, he's two days uh, more senior than I am. So I think that a lot of, the, <laughs> a lot of these judges are pretty close as well. Uh, the first is um, a Judge um, Michael Newman, he um, uh, sits in Dayton in the Southern District of Ohio, and he was uh, confirmed in uh, November 12th, 2020, or at least uh, sworn in on November 12th, 2020. Um, the second is uh, 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 Judge James Knapp, uh, he's at the far end. Um, he sits in Toledo in the Northern District of Ohio, and he was confirmed uh, or sworn into office a week later, November 19th, 2020. And the third, last but not least, is Judge uh, Philip Calabrese, uh, and he sits in Cleveland and um, was confirmed two weeks or so after that, or not confirmed, sworn in on December 5th, uh, 2020. So just at the tail end of the last administration. 
I guess the first question I ask, will ask, uh, I've done a lot of these, that's why I didn't want to get into the background, because if I did, then they would just be saying the same things, but if you could just tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from, and why you decided you wanted to be a district judge. So we'll start with Judge Newman. Sure. Can I say, uh, Judge Murphy, what an honor it is to be here? And I'll echo uh, Judge Murphy's comments. Um, it's wonderful to be here with the Federal Society and old friends, and it's great to see everybody in person. It just means the world to me. It's been a long, long time on Zoom. I was sending federal prisoners to prison <coughs> from my basement. <laughs> and that gets very old very quickly, I assure you. So uh, it is an honor, it's an honor to be here. And can I just very briefly say thank you to Lisa Zell. Uh, Lisa's very modest. I'm sure she's gonna look at the ground while I'm mentioning her name. <laughs> Lisa's done so much for everyone in FedSoc. I, I know she went to bat for me when I wanted to be a district judge. And Lisa, I wanted to publicly acknowledge you and say thank you. And what you did for me is significant, and I'm very grateful, and I will remain so. Thank you. And uh, Professor Chris Walker and Professor Jonathan Adler, I think Professor Adler's here, but maybe Professor Walker's too. They both served on the bipartisan commission that Senators Portman and Brown put together, so obviously I'm very grateful to them as well. Uh, very briefly, uh, Judge, uh, I was a partner at the Dinsmore and Scholl firm. Before that, I was a clerk uh, to Judge Jones on the Sixth Circuit, the same judge that uh, Judge uh, the Park clerked for. I uh, was, a, was a career clerk to a magistrate <coughs> judge, Judge Sherman in Cincinnati. Uh, at Dinsmore, I ran the uh, Labor and Employment Appellate Practice Group and uh, taught a lot as an adjunct professor at uh, Chase and uh, University of Dayton and mostly University of Cincinnati as well. Um, was a magistrate judge appointed in 2011, so I served uh, almost a decade as a, as a magistrate judge. Um, and I'm just honored to serve. And why I wanted to serve, I care greatly about the courts. Um, I believe strongly in the, the limited role of, a, of the district judge, quite frankly. Um, and I just care greatly about public service. Oh, by seniority, okay. <laughs> or, or possibly by height, also. Uh, <laughs> If it's by weight, I'd have been first. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. It's, it's great to see a, a room full of people. Uh, the, the, I've had two signs that, that the dawn is near today. First of all, seeing a, a room full of people, and somebody just texted me a little blurb that Costco is bringing back samples. So I, the, 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 the dawn is, is on the horizon, even as we sit here. Um, Judge Brown, I, you made me laugh and you made me cry. I'm texting feverishly, let her keep going. This is not going to, you know, uh, God, it's like being uh, Kenny G coming out after the Rolling Stones warmed up the crowd a little bit. <laughs> I, what, what, what can I possibly say? Um, you know, but I guess, you know, we, there's work to be done. Uh, I, I was a magistrate judge for 10 years before um, I was a, a district judge, and before that I was a civil practitioner for 15 years, and before that I was a law clerk. And you gotta, you gotta be a law clerk to recognize how improbable you think it is. Now maybe these guys, down at the end, okay, they, they law clerk and they can see themselves as judges. For me, the thought of being a judge after being a law clerk is sort of like being a hot dog vendor getting called out to play second base, okay? That, that, that was not on my radar. I mean, I grew up on a farm in Northeast Ohio. I didn't know a lawyer. Um, so to connect the dots between, uh, I was a farm boy who I went to college to be a guy on the radio and you know, washed out of that career f fairly unmercifully, but uh, I, can still, I can still fall back. The sports and weather brought to you by Park Honda. Well, they go the distance for you. So if, uh, if nothing else works out and I get impeached and I find myself penniless, I can at least go play radio guy again. Um, I, uh, I have trouble connecting the dots without lifting my pencil off the page. I'll just say that on the, the and, and okay, another peek behind the curtain here. I felt so guilty being in the room uh, during the first panel this morning, because first of all, uh, President Abhoff was at the same restaurant I was at last night in Toledo. He was on time this morning, and I was not. But uh, I'll, I'll blame some traffic or uh, some cattle on the roadway or something between here and there, but it, it didn't work out. Um, but I, uh, I, I just, uh, it, it's, it's improbable as heck that, I, that I'm here, but I'm, I'm happy that I am. But what I was telling you is I felt so guilty being in this room with all of you that because I had not been a member of the Federalist Society, guess, um, I had gone, to, I go to the, I, I, I freeload on the Toledo chapters meetings. I pretty, I, I pretty regularly, I'll say very regularly, attend the Toledo chapters meetings, but I never joined. And then when I was uh, applying for this job, 
on the one hand, I thought, well, I, I should join, but on the other hand, I didn't want to look like a phony who just joined up um, to, to have that credential or, or, or mark is, is depending on, but, but I did get help, I did, I did get help from, um, you know, Dean Reuters, the general counsel of, of, the, of the National Fed SOC, um, sort of vetted me and helped me in the process interviewing at the White House, so I will, I will always be indebted, uh, frankly, literally and figuratively to you all. And what I, this is a long way around the barn to tell you that I sat back there at the table and I joined the Federalist Society during the program. So uh, I'm, now, I'm now a member and I'm, not, I'm proud of it. I'm not ashamed of it. So, Phil? So you didn't, you didn't join before the confirmation vote? I did not, no. Yeah, I, I, very I, that was, <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, by way of background, uh, I was taken back during Justice Bollock's uh, remarks this morning because I uh, began my professional career working in the Wisconsin uh, General Assembly as a staffer, and I remember that, uh, uh, that budget bill that he was talking about quite well as well as some others, and, and perhaps we'll talk about uh, some of the statutory interpretation points and, and the like that, that come from those sorts of experiences. Uh, but it was really during my uh, three years in, in that capacity that I decided to go to law school at all. And then after law school, I uh, had the honor of beginning my legal career uh, clerking for Judge Batchelder, uh, then went into private practice as a civil lawyer handling a complex commercial uh, caseload for a number of years uh, before being appointed to the bench uh, in state court up in Cuyahoga County, the Court of Common Pleas in July of 2019 uh, before uh, uh, nomination and confirmation to this position. Uh, as for why I wanted to do it, I would point to, to two things. First, uh, to kind of uh, build off of where Judge Brown left us, uh, it, it was partly to uh, uh, hopefully be one of those people to, to pick things up and keep them from hitting the ground to the extent I can, uh, both from you, uh, Judge, as well as uh, Judge Batchelder, who's been a tremendous uh, mentor throughout my career. Uh, but also over, over my years of, of practice in state and federal courts uh, and civil litigation, I, I came to see that our justice system, which I think is uh, one of the jewels of our system of government is in uh, a real crisis point, both in uh, criminal justice administration as well as on the civil side. Uh, and I, I decided I, I needed to try to do something about that, so here I am. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess the next question is just uh, maybe a little bit about the confirmation process. Um, uh, I, I think it might be a little different than the process I went through since there was no um, commission. I don't know how many uh, folks out there know about the commission. Maybe talk about it a little bit and um, just your own experiences from that step to the, going through the, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, I'll st uh, start with you, Judge Calabrese. We'll go in reverse order. Oh, um, <laughs> well, so for the district court positions, um, and there, uh, Judge Newman alluded to it, there is a, a Senator Brown and Senator Portman have a bipartisan uh, commission. There are some members of it here in the audience today, uh, some vacancies in the Northern District at the moment. Uh, and they screen candidates, and so I think we all went through that process. Um, I'm not sure how much in, in, into the weeds we need to, to get about that, but it's a lengthy process. Every time you turn around, there's more vetting. Uh, there, there's a lot that's unwritten uh, and unknown and unknowable. I feel like having gone through it, I still know only a fraction of what actually the process involved. Perhaps less. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's a total lightning strike, and you know, when you uh, take uh, the oath of office on December 5 in an outgoing administration, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't leave that much room to spare. Uh, so it, it is you know, quite, quite fortunate to make it through. Um, it's, not, it's a process that's not for the faint of heart, I will say that. Um, and there are, there are a lot of uh, challenges with that. But I, I will say there are a couple really positive things that um, perhaps get lost uh, in, in the shuffle on it. Uh, one is that I got to know both uh, Judge Newman and Judge Knapp, uh, as well as no a number of other colleagues around the country uh, quite well through that process. And that's, that's one of the really nice uh, pieces of it. Uh, folks I'm still in touch with, and we ask each other for advice and check in on each other from time to time. 
Um, but there's also some aspects of the process that are actually the very best of what you'd want in a judicial selection process. And that's not necessarily the, the story that you hear uh, from the public uh, uh, accounts of it all the time, but, it, but it's really true there. And, and the commission is a part of that. It's a lot of work uh, and it's important work, um, but it's, it's, it's a daunting process, but it, it has its ups and its downs. Judge, Judge Neb, I wonder, did you guys have a, uh, I think your, your Senate Judiciary Committee hearing was the same day? We were, we were all at the same time. And was it, was it a Zoom? It hearing? was a Zoom. Yes. So uh, can you describe that? How was, how was a Zoom Senate Judiciary? I might, I might have preferred that. I, <laughs> so that, that's, that, that's legit. I, I actually, I did prefer it from a point of self-preservation because I'd be lying if I didn't say there were a few notes spread out on the, on the table out of the camera view. Um, I missed, you know, the being introduced at, and getting to take your family. And, and so I missed a little bit of that. I, I, I don't think I would trade that pomp and circumstance for the uh, just the ability to uh, there was some comfort being in my own office as opposed to sitting at a table there with a, you know, with, with, a, with a spotlight. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say publicly during our hearing, um, I think it was particularly uh, Senator Howley kind of kind of zeroed in on Phil a little bit, and it was one of those mixed emotion things. Where I'm thinking, oh, this is off just a tiny bit, please. But not but too I'm much. Glad that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with the Zoom, it was a little clunkier to bounce around from candidate to candidate. So, so when one person started taking fire, um, you could sort of, you know. It's not me. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I walked out, somebody told me I would judge uh, Rather a, a beer after. after <laughs> so maybe, maybe the same thing. But uh, Judge Newman, do you want to just describe it a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, it was definitely surreal, uh, the whole process being on video. Uh, we didn't know uh, really if it was going to be on video or in person. Uh, for those of you who know me, my wife Rachel and I have triplets. They're 14 years old, three girls. Of course, Rachel had bought matching uh, dresses uh, for the triplets, which is a uh, a negotiation in itself for them to dress alike at age 14. Uh, that didn't happen, so I was in my office <clears throat> looking at my laptop computer with uh, an IT person ten from the court 10 feet away. Heaven forbid the, uh, the internet goes down, right? I thought that would be the end. Rachel was home at our house uh, with the triplets watching, uh, watching live on, on the video with them all dressed up. Uh, and then it's over, and you go and to the IT person, you shake hands. And I said, I, I hope we did well. And that's it. And then I got in my car and I went back home. So emotionally, it was kind of a letdown. Uh, it's complicated, but I spent two months prepping like a bar exam for the, for the, for the few questions that we did get. Let, let me just add two, two other notes. One, um, as a result of the commission's work, there's a degree of bipartisan cooperation uh, for the district court nominations out of Ohio that I, I had people from around the country call me. Uh, for example, both uh, Senator Portman and Senator Brown spoke on our behalf uh, to introduce us at the Judiciary Committee. And I, I had people call me from around the country to say that Ohio had a good day that day. So that was very gratifying to be a part of. And, and um, I will say the same, same thing that Judge Calvary is saying. I, I, on, on a really serious note, uh, that made me happy that the system worked as well as it did. And, and I, I, the other thing I will say is like you can't, uh, I, I was talking with a friend last night who asked a little bit about this process. Um, so you, you, you can't really make this up and it's hard to kind of appreciate, but our, our nominations were delayed slightly uh, at the outset because of the first impeachment trial and like even just that statement alone is, you know, remarkable. Then, then we had the pandemic. Um, there were further uh, delays as a result of, um, you know, riots and civil unrest around the country uh, in various places. Um, we had our judiciary committee hearing, and within 24 hours, Justice Ginsburg had passed away. And so you just think about all of these uh, contingencies one after another, and it, it's, uh, I mean, you really just cannot make it up. It's, it, it's like a roller coaster ride. It's the, same, it's the same analogy I use when I'm settling cases and I talk to people and they say, I don't know whether I want to settle or not. And I say, do you want to get off the roller coaster because you have good days in litigation and bad days? And they say, I want the roller coaster to stop. There was a part of this that was like a roller coaster and, and we were all going to see it through to the end. I think we became like brothers, if you want to be serious for a moment. 
we were talking to each other and we're still talking to each other three times a day. I think because of this process, because it was so different, because of the pandemic, because of the impeachment and the death of Justice Ginsburg and a number of other things that have just, no one knew if it was gonna happen or not. Um, we bonded in a way that I think this is, this is a lifelong bond that I don't think this is ever gonna dissipate. And that's significant. And we know now lots of other nominees from around the country, they don't have stories like that. This was a, it was a very interesting process and we developed a very interesting and very uh, deep friendship as a result. Huh. We're the only three guys in the room that uh, the pandemic was not the biggest story of 2020. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, to pull back on the stick a little bit, you might say, well, why, what about, what, where does this bipartisan commission come from? And, and what, what it is, is it's a, it's a blue slip insurance agreement that the senators, uh, I think, have, and again, this is, this is a little further above my pay grade, but I believe there's a, at least a, a, an agreement in place that if the uh, senator who's uh, of the same party as the president, if we have mixed senators, um, if the person picks someone who had been approved and vetted by the bipartisan commission, the other senator will, I'll even say enthusiastically, tender a blue slip for, for that person. So that's that, that's where that comes from. And to take it a bit further, the blue slip is the process. The home state senators, it's still respected. Both home state senators typically have to approve of a nominee from their state at the district court level. That's been done away with at the uh, Court of Appeals level. But at the district court level, the, the home state senators have to uh, uh, to bless the, the selection. I just remember the night before my hearing saying to my wife, uh, did you ever in your wildest dreams think I'd be testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee? And uh, she looked at me as she does, and she said, Jimmy, I'm thinking of my top five wildest dreams, and you're not in any of them. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta my so, so le lest anyone think the blue slip discussion is, uh, <laughs> it, that, that this process is not uh, for the faint of heart. When, when we met with, uh, with uh, uh, DOJ, the uh, Office of Legal Policy, OLP, to prep, day one, it's a two-day prep session. Remember, there were six of us. Mm -hmm. There were six of us. So you're just before the hearing. You're prepping, what, two days before the hearing? Uh, and there were six of us day one. We go for day two, there's five of us. And they said, oh, there was someone who had a blue slip problem last night. Don't worry about that person. We're going to just continue. OK. It was almost like you're in a James Bond movie, and the trap door opens, and one of you going to be the <laughs> trap door, right? And the three of us looked at each other, and uh, it, was, uh, it was not for the faint of heart, for sure. Yes, well, thanks for uh, going through the process. Um, so let's uh, transition, I guess, a little bit to the, uh, just um, taking the bench. And I wonder if you would compare and contrast um, the duties of a district judge versus the duties of a, a, a magistrate judge, uh, Judge Newman. I'll, I'll let you start. And I'm curious on the, um, s s some districts have different duties for magistrate judges. So I'm curious, just your duties in the Southern District of Ohio, and then maybe Judge Neff could talk about his duties in the Northern District of Ohio and how they compare to uh, uh, your, your current district judge duties. Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, <laughs> I sit in Dayton, was a magistrate judge in Dayton for, for many years, about a dec close to a decade. Um, there are two active uh, magistrate judges in Dayton, and what the magistrate judges do in the Southern District is, for the most part, uh, similar in Cincinnati, Columbus, and Dayton. Uh, we handle mediation uh, differently. In, in the Dayton seat of court, the magistrate judges themselves do the mediation, we spend a lot of time doing mediation. It's also different in that we have Wright-Patterson Air Force Base there. So we have one of most unusual dockets in the United States, I think there's maybe five other courts that are cities that are like this, where we have a huge misdemeanor docket. It's federal property, so all those, uh, those criminal cases come to, uh, come to a federal court, to the magistrate judges, whether they're assaults, DUIs, uh, marijuana cases, et cetera. Uh, so that keeps you very busy. A number of consent cases, a lot of mediation, a lot of misdemeanor criminal. And then one thing we did, which I, I think we're going to discuss a little bit today, uh, we've done a civics program in Dayton, and it's been very successful. And I know there's a, we are, Southern District have a very active civics committee, which I chair, and I'm honored to serve with Judge Murphy on the Sixth Circuit Civics Committee. And I think maybe that might be, in addition to deciding cases, the most important thing I did as a magistrate judge, talking to young people about the rule of law how the Constitution works, how the judicial system works, the third branch, the importance of the third branch. We've seen in the last couple of years, 3,000 kids, 3,000 kids have been into my courtroom. And when, for whatever reason, because of this, they didn't have the money to come to our courtroom, I got in my car and I drove to see them. And that's beginning to happen around the country. And thank goodness, 
that uh, the Sixth Circuit is very supportive of that effort and makes me very, very happy. So of all the things I've done, I'm honored to have decided cases. I'm honored that I never got reversed in my nine years as a magistrate judge. I'm very proud of that. But I will be honest with you, I think the civics program uh, is really significant. And, and that's the thing that gave me great, great hope for the future. Great. Uh, so I, I just have to tell a quick story. I think um, uh, you, you mentioned the misdemeanors. That's what I actually think I realized I should be an appellate judge because as a 3L at University of Chicago, I had this little, little card that allowed me to go practice. And we did misdemeanor day in Chicago, and I think I lost every parking ticket. So uh, it's like, maybe I should not be a trial lawyer. <laughs> but, uh, but Judge Neff, can you, can you compare the magistrate duties in the, in, um, the Northern District in Toledo? And how well, I'm proud to say I got reversed a few times. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like playing euchre. If you don't get euchred once in a while, you're not being aggressive enough. Um, so, um, well, in the Northern District, I think probably as well as, as there's very few districts in the country that do a better job of treating the magistrate judges as colleagues on the bench. Um, so the magistrate judges attend the judges' meetings. They're really only excused when the district judges vote about, frankly, something per particular to the magistrate judges. The rest of the time, they're there. Um, I had a robust civil docket because I'm in sort of a, a branch location in Toledo of the district court. And uh, in our building in particular, there's a, you know, a brotherhood or sisterhood of, among the judges. Right now, it's all, all men. But, but there's no caste system of you know, the Article Threes versus the magistrate judges. And that's very, uh, unfortunately, real some places. But in the Northern District, there is absolutely none of that. And I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that. And you guys can all keep a secret, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I probably shouldn't do, but I'll tell you that my replacement in Toledo is sitting in the back of the room back there. Uh, Daryl Clay, who's a proud member of this organization, has been selected, but, but he's going to be sworn in a week from today. So this time next week, he will be the new magistrate judge in Toledo. And I wouldn't say he has big shoes to fill. He at least has smelly shoes to fill. So <laughs> Phil, or I'm sorry, Daryl, congratulations. And Uh, Judge Calabrese, I wonder if you could uh, just compare and contrast uh, the life as a common pleas judge in Cuyahoga County versus the life as a, of a federal judge. In yeah, so any, anyone who's appeared in uh, common pleas court in Cuyahoga County remembers that experience, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, um, uh, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say I had some wonderful colleagues who uh, li literally on one day I was appearing in front of them and um, felt like they would have put a knife in my chest if one had been available to them and then literally were hugging me the next day welcoming me so they were very uh, supportive and I learned a lot from them uh, both in practice and then on the bench but um, I, I guess what I would say is the common police court's a high volume court when I was there I had 500 cases on my uh, docket uh, on average every month uh, about 125 of them were criminal cases and the rest were civil. The civil cases generally broke down into a couple buckets. Um, there were some what I consider more high volume cases, collections, foreclosures, <laughs> things like that. But then also um, the, the civil cases beyond that generally involved things like uh, med mal cases and car accidents. But there were um, probably a dozen or so pretty significant cases uh, that are comparable to the ones on my docket now at any given time. Um, now I have about 180 cases on my docket, uh, 24 of which are criminal. Uh, what, what I will say is the major difference I've, I've noticed thus far is um, the cases in federal court do tend to be more, um, I, I don't want to say significant because there were significant cases in state court as well. I think they involve more uh, heavy lifting on my part. Some of the issues are a little bit more complicated uh, and things like that. There's a lot more um, motion practice and, and uh, uh, discovery and the like. Um, and on the criminal side, that's been slowly ramping up both because of the pandemic and the way uh, new judges dockets are created in the Northern District, which we just get the criminal cases off the draw. So. So kind of getting into the, into those a uh, little bit more slowly, which is which has been nice. But you just get thrown into it in common pleas, and uh, you know I had the uh, 
good fortune to try a lot of cases there um, to juries and the bench before COVID hit and um, had a lot of you know really significant civil and criminal cases. Great, great. So um, I want to transition maybe a little bit to kind of just how you how you view the district judge's role in, in managing discovery. Um, the chief justice wrote a, his year-end report in 2015. Um, he actually started off by um, talking about duels and Alexander Hamilton, and, um, but he was actually referring to the amendments to the federal rules of civil procedure, uh, suggesting that district judges should take a more active approach to managing um, discovery so that um, the cost of discovery are proportional um, to the type of case that is at issue. Um, uh, judge Newman, since I guess you have um, experience of, as, as a magistrate judge, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit as, as a district judge, how you view your role um, in implementing kind of the, the, the new proportionality principle. Sure, so I, I'm very familiar with that. I've spoken about it. I, I take it very seriously. When I was a magistrate judge, uh, what concerned me was the cost of litigation and the length of litigation. And I worked very, very hard, and I'm continuing to work very, very hard to make litigation less expensive and to make it more efficient. And one very simple, this is a very simple idea, and that is to have people talk to you by phone. Uh, there's no need to get in an airplane and fly to Dayton, Ohio, if you're a lawyer in DC, for example, right? We could, this is all pre-Zoom, all pre-pandemic. But I think in our court, that hadn't really been done very much before. And I came from the Dinsmore firm, and the, the Dinsmore firm and the partners were just constantly complaining, why is federal litigation so expensive? And I vowed, if I became a judge, that I would do whatever I could, and I have continued to do, to make it less expensive. So I meet with people frequently. Uh, now that uh, I'm a district judge, we're gonna be referring some of the discovery matters to the magistrate judges, but I'm gonna still stay involved. And I talk to the lawyers in these preliminary pretrial conferences. Again, we're doing them by phone. And I say to them, I want you to call me. Call me when you have a discovery dispute. Don't let this blossom into a big mess that you then have to file a 50-page motion to compel and discovery stops in its tracks and it takes a month for that to be briefed and then everything is just, you know, it's, 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 it's stopped, it's stayed. We're not gonna proceed that way. We're gonna move things forward efficiently. And unless there's a motion to stay discovery, discovery's gonna keep moving forward, but I want you to call me. That was kind of an earth-shaking, shattering idea for people, but I've done that for the last nine years. I'm gonna to continue to do that as a district judge. Um, and I think the word is out now in the legal community. He's not kidding. He's really gonna work, work with us, not as an adversary, to make litigation be faster, and which I do. Um, and I've also talked to, talked to, to lawyers about you know, if, if you have a case that's gonna, that's gonna lead to a fairly quick resolution, perhaps a mediation, open to doing limited discovery? Why are we doing that? And I think that's something that lawyers are now seem very happy about. So we're talking about doing limited discovery, teeing the case up for mediation, if that's what the parties want. I don't force it on anyone, it's a voluntary process. But I like working with the lawyers to make the process work the way I think it should. And I do take the Chief Justice's comments very seriously. How do, how do, you, um, how, how do you go about getting compromised without, without the motion? Do you just say, like, this is my instinct as of where it would No, be? so it's interesting. <laughs> on, the, on, the simp on the more simple issues, they get on the phone and then we just, we just talk it out. And I'll say something like, if I were to make a ruling based on what you've told me so far, this is what I'm inclined to do. And they'll say, that's all we want. We just wanted you to give some direction. We can take it from here on. On the more complicated issues, I'll ask them to do a limited briefing. Uh, and on some the really complicated issues, like a privilege issue, for example, we'll say, okay, let's do very formal briefing, but in a much more abbreviated time schedule. And then I'll make the decision in a much more abbreviated way. And they're very receptive to that. So it depends on the circumstance, but I, I work with them to get a quick resolution. Okay. Yep. Uh, Judge Knapp, how, how, how do your experiences compare? Is that similar to your process, or do you have a different perspective on? Well, first of all, in the Northern District, the district judges tend to do all their own discovery stuff unless they're really tied up. We don't, re, we don't and I know some districts, uh, they farm it out to magistrate judges. We don't, we don't roll that way. Uh, secondly, we have a long tradition of uh, act, active judicial management in discovery and discovery disputes. We had something called differentiated case management that, that we rolled out back in the early 90s when I was a law clerk. Um, and it, it basically says before anybody can file a, a discovery motion, you have to get on the phone with the court. And so we, you know, we've carried that forward for 20 years now plus, or 30, I guess it's 30. Um, and I find my, my own case management, of course, everybody would, who thinks discovery takes too long and costs too much? Everybody, but there's just way, we're, we're sort of stuck in our, our ways a little bit. I get people uh, talking 
um, at every opportunity I get because um, I think it's a lot more productive to talk with each other. Um, we tend to be a lot less emails tend to be more arguing and you know whereas you know I get, I get two people on the phone and I say okay what what's the problem here uh, well why do you want that well because this well couldn't we just uh, give you a look at yeah that would work okay and that took you know five minutes of my life as opposed to the three hours one side would spend writing a motion and the three hours the other side would spend responding to it and the five or ten hours my staff and I would spend it's just so much more efficient and it, and it gets to a better result just frankly uh, I can't tell you what a high percentage of discovery problems resolve themselves in about a five minute conversation and if there's a, a chewy privilege issue or something yeah we'll file the motions and let you make your records and stuff with the uh, with the understanding that uh, I'm probably going to be safe from getting I reverse from my colleagues down in Cincinnati because uh, I make errors all the time, but I'll be damned if it's going to be clear error. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, Judge Judge Calabrese, I wonder if you could um, if you could compare uh, the process of discovery in state court versus federal. If state court has, has, in some respects, in some states, is known as the Wild West when it comes to discovery. I wonder if that perspective has influenced how you view things in, in the federal system? Or? You know, the, the rules in Ohio are pretty close uh, to the federal rules, so I haven't treated it too differently between state court or federal court. I guess the only thing I would add uh, uh, to what uh, uh, Judge Newman and Judge Knapp had to say is, is, is perhaps two things. One, um, uh, I think what the rules, even before the 2015 amendments uh, contemplated and required, was active judicial case management. And, and I think anyone who's practiced at the trial level knows what active judicial case management is not. Uh, active judicial case management is not going to the CMC, proposing a schedule of six or nine months of discovery and coming back at the end of it. Um, because we all know what happens in that world. Uh, 30 days before the deadline, everybody panics. Uh, realizes they haven't done what they need to do and starts pointing, uh, making a record to point the finger at the other side. And absolutely nobody's happy in that world. So uh, like my colleagues, I try to stay out in front of that and be uh, active in the discovery process. I do refer some of the messier ones uh, to the magistrate judges thus far. Um, that's a little bit of a judgment call. I've been involved in, in some of the messier ones myself where I, th I think it's been necessary. Um, the other thing I would say is I have uh, be before, uh, I, I have a standing order uh, and, and with respect to uh, discovery, uh, before you can raise any discovery dispute, um, I require you to do two things. Uh, the, the first is to personally confer with the other side and to, to pick up on this point, that is not exchanging emails. I had that status conference yesterday with a case uh, where the lawyers were telling me that they had traded two rounds of emails on this issue. And I said, well, but have you talked to each other? And they had not talked to each other. So I, I said, look, we're, we're done for today. We're gonna come back in two weeks after you've talked to each other and uh, actually fleshed out what your issues are. Because there, it, was, it was very clear within about two minutes of them talking, they had a fundamental misunderstanding of what the requests and positions of the other side were. If you talk and still have issues, and that does happen before you file any discovery motion, you're, you have to get on the phone with me and talk to me, and that's where I'll make a determination about how we, we proceed from there. Great. Well, transition a little bit uh, to a related topic of how, how much do you view um, the district judge's role uh, in settling cases versus um, uh, trying cases? So I'm curious, Judge Newman, do you, do you think about settlement at the outset of a case? Do you talk to the parties at the initial status conference about possibilities for settlement? Do you propose mediation? Or do you think that it's kind of a hands-off approach and if they think it's appropriate, they can come to you? I talk about mediation with attorneys uh, in every single case. So if you have a preliminary pretrial conference with me, we'll, we'll end up talking about the scheduling order and mediation and discovery. Uh, I'm still not sure if I'm going to actually end up doing mediation. I did a lot of mediation as a, as a magistrate judge. In the Dayton seat, of course, the two magistrate judges do, do all the mediation. 
I miss it already. Uh, I got sworn in November. I already miss it terribly. Uh, so I would like to go back and do it. I have issues about conflict, about cases that ultimately Andre decides. So that, that concerns me. And, and what we've done in Dayton is, if you're the judge who's going to ever make a ruling in a case, then that magistrate judge, for example, the one assisting the parties with discovery, the other magistrate judge does the mediation. So that way you're free to tell the magistrate judge mediator anything and everything you want to tell because it's never going to affect a ruling in any way. I like that system. So if we could find a way that I could be uh, isolated and perhaps help one of the other district judges in our court and do mediation for them, and perhaps they would do mediation for me, that probably would how it would work. Um, Again, it's my attempt just to be just to be realistic. When you have this huge number of cases that either get resolved on summary judgment or by mediation, uh, we all kind of know that's where the cases are going. And to be proactive, I think, is just a, is a smart thing. Quick answer, getting back to what Judge Calabrese and Judge Nepp said about discovery, uh, I view this as hand-holding, quite frankly. What I did as a, as a magistrate judge, and I'm beginning to do the same thing as a district judge, is quite frankly doing a lot of hand-holding with counsel. And, and when, when I was a magistrate judge, we would meet with them at a minimum, at a minimum three times. Uh, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the discovery period. And that's because the very thing that Judge Calabrese and Judge Nepp talked about, where the, the calendar just gets away from folks despite their best efforts and the discovery gets crunched up at the end, you want to avoid that. And why am I talking about that in the context of mediation? Well, if you haven't done your discovery, you're probably not ready to mediate the dispute, right? So they're, they're really, in my perspective, an interrelated concepts. Judge, Judge Calabrese, you mentioned um, uh, uh, earlier in a conversation with me that you kind of took the job because you wanted to try cases. I wonder if you could yeah. share how that perspective affects how, how you view um, settlement or um, if you even view it as feasible given the, the, as Judge Newman said, the number of cases, it's impossible to try them. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think trial courts should try cases. I want to try cases. Um, uh, we don't have enough trials, uh, both civil and criminal. Uh, I think we should have more of them. It's absolutely the best part of our system. Um, it's, it, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into that and a tremendous amount of risk for everybody. And my, my view generally when it comes to these issues is that if you, um, it, you know, set a schedule uh, that's going to hold uh, and it's a realistic, meaningful schedule, uh, the cases are more often than not going to resolve themselves because people are generally fairly risk averse, uh, which is unfortunate and it's a bit of a paradox. My, my experience in practice was that lawyers have a very easy time sniffing out the judges who don't want to try the cases and are using it as a bullying tactic to try to get people uh, to settle. Um, I'm frankly not really interested in that. I'd rather try the case. Um, so come on up to the Northern District. We'll try some cases. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we're starting up again post-COVID. It, 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 it's great. Um, um, you know, I guess the one, the one thing I would say is, uh, although that's true, I think statistically we know that 99.9% .9 of all cases, civil and criminal, are going to resolve without a trial. And that's just, that's just the numbers. So I do say to, to lawyers at the start of every case, um, th that's the reality. If we need to have a, a trial, you know, I'd love to have the trial and we'll, we'll, we'll get there. It'll be great. But that's not likely to happen. So what, what do the parties need? What do the lawyers need properly to evaluate the case and reach uh, an early efficient resolution? Um, I, I will tell you, in state court, by and large, uh, practitioners were pretty receptive to that conversation and would often say, well, all I really need is this set of documents or I need to depose this one witness. And you could, you could do that, you could make that all happen in about 30 or 45 days and then the cases would generally resolve. Not always, but most of the time. In federal court, I ask that question and people don't even understand the words I'm saying to them. Um, so that's the one thing I would encourage lawyers to, to think hard about from your perspective and to work with your clients about is what do you really need to resolve the case? I mean, it may, maybe it's a Daubert hearing. Um, you know, maybe it's a, a ruling uh, on one limited question of law. You may have six causes of action or three defenses or whatever it is. But if you really need rulings on one or two of them, well, let's prioritize that. We can talk about that. And that's a much easier use of everybody's uh, time and resources. So I've had the exact same experience. It's strange that we haven't had this conversation before. Uh, I've asked the same question of lawyers and they get the same blank stares. 
So, and maybe that's because the lawyers haven't prepped enough and know the case well enough before the preliminary pretrial conference, but that's surprised me as well. Uh, Judge Nepp, do you have anything to add? Uh, just your perspective on settlement um, and uh, just district judge's role in it? Well, I did a lot of settlement conferences as a magistrate judge, and when I say a lot, I'm, I'm talking probably in excess of 100 a year, and I, I, I kind of go all in on those, so I, I, I can't dunk a basketball, but I figured out how to get people talking to a resolution in, in most civil litigation. Um, I, 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 we're a little different, uh, at least in, in my end of the Northern District. Um, the only case that I won't do my own settlement conferences is if, if there's any issue at all for the bench, okay? If there's, if there's, a, if there's any issue that the jury's not gonna be deciding, i.e. if I'm gonna have to assess the credibility of a person or argument who, who I would otherwise be having ex parte with during the settlement conference, I farm that out. But otherwise I do them myself because I know about the case and, and the jury's gonna be deciding you know, which version or, or whatever it is. So I don't, I don't worry about that. Um, what Phil said, 99.9, .9, it's actually the statistics, it's, not, it's literally 99.5% of the civil cases in the Northern District of Ohio uh, do not go to trial. Uh, you know, 25, 35% go out on summary judgment. The rest of them go uh, in, in, in settlement conferences. I'm kind of a simple guy, so I speak a lot in analogies, and my case management structure looks a lot like a hand in Texas Hold'em. Okay, you got your whole cards. That's sort of the pleadings up front and what you know about the case. Then we see the flop. Okay, the four cards come, and that's, that's your Rule 26 disclosures and some very targeted discovery, okay? A deposition or two for each side. Then we're gonna hit the pause button, and we're gonna, we're gonna try and have a settlement conference. And frankly, whether, uh, whether you really want to or not, unless, unless there's somebody really screaming, I'm gonna, and, and there's some principle involved that they can't possibly settle the case. But other than that, we're gonna have a settlement conference, and you know, at some point I usually pause and say okay, and there's two reasons I say okay. One reason I say okay is uh, to ask you if you agree with that. The other reason I say okay is to ask, did you understand that? And I'm very much asking the second version of okay, did you understand that? So my deal is, if you play ball with me on that, we, we do sort of this targeted discovery to get the case lined up so you really know what you need to know to evaluate the case for settlement. Sometimes that means the case is worth a lot of money, sometimes that means the case is worth some money. Sometimes, sometimes I said I have settlement conferences and the answer is the plaintiff gets no money, but I convince the plaintiff that they're, they're digging a dry hole without the defense having to, um, that was nice English, right? My mother would be so proud. Um, without, the, without the defense needing or being required to file a motion for summary judgment or a motion to dismiss, we, we essentially accomplish that same thing at the settlement conference. The flip side is, if the lawyers play ball with me, I promise them that if they need a little bit more time on the other side of that settlement conference to do this, the, 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 the sort of scorch, oh, it's not scorch shirt, this sort of pejorative. If they need to do the rest of the stuff that, that needs to be in the can before they file a dispositive motion or for trial, I'll accommodate that a little bit. So it's a, it, it's a protocol that works pretty well for my case management. It's like, what do we need to do to get the case ready for trial? I'm, I'm sorry, ready for settlement conference, have a settlement conference, and then do the rest of the case. So there's, there's very much a halftime show in the middle, middle of every piece of litigation I have, and it looks like a settlement conference. So. It's all very complicated. Let's just have a trial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we, well, the next topic we were gonna talk about is briefing on summary judgment motions to dismiss. Maybe we should just do away with that and go straight to the trial. <laughs> no, no discovery, but. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, this is getting more into kind of my um, area a little bit because it's uh, briefing legal issues. Um, I guess I, I'm interested in your perspective. The one um, kind of pet peeve I have is I often see um, appellate briefs. So this is at, at the stage when presumably the issues have been winnowed down and appellate briefs will have like eight issues and that's still rather common. I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, if, um, uh, uh, motion practice is even worse than that because they're just trying to throw everything at, at a wall and see what sticks or, or do you have any thoughts on just generally how parties should go about winnowing down So issues? that is surprising to me after you spend six to nine months or longer uh, doing discovery and then you get a kitchen sink summary judgment brief and I would think my goodness you would should or would 
know the case much better and be much narrowly tailored in your summary judgment arguments. So that's surprising to me. The other thing that's surprising, and I've been surprised about this for years, is that sometimes people will bury their best argument in the middle or the end, the judge is nodding, the middle or the end of their brief. It's like, that's your winner. Why wasn't that number one? Why wasn't that on page one? And uh, so I'm not sure if you've seen the same thing in your court as well. It's just shocking to me. And I'm thinking maybe that's a lack of confidence in the, in the potential success of the argument. Maybe that's not knowing the case well, but just, you don't even have to be a judge. I was a law clerk years ago. It's like, my goodness, a law clerk would read this and say, well, there's the winner. So that's surprising to me. And it's been surprising and it continues to be surprising. I'm not sure what yeah, I mean, I'll talking say, to uh, audiences like this and telling them, uh, but that, that, that is a little bit surprising. Yeah, I mean, a related issue is, I mean, you're talking about eight issues or the like. I'm very much a three issue guy. I think if you have more than three issues, you don't, you don't have anything. So um, <laughs> you're, you're really, I mean, that's Justice Jackson, right? Um, you, you really have limited time and attention from your panel, whether it's an appellate panel or, or any of us. Um, you know, one of, you know, I think you really do have to pick issues, even on summary judgment. I mean, one of the things that drive, there's, there's two things that drive me crazy. One is substantive and one is procedural. The substantive one is that people make uh, a bunch of arguments and they will put arguments in there um, uh, that, you know, maybe a race judicata argument or a jurisdictional argument or things like that. And I feel obligated to address those, but the parties aren't really, they're, they're pretty weak arguments, even if they're developed. So know your case, pick your battles, you lose credibility when, when you raise those issues, in my view. Procedurally, I would say it, it's really hard, even on a limited summary judgment record, um, to navigate. So I, I probably need to be a little bit more clear about this in my standing order, but I very much want a joint record filed. So I, I'm at the tail end of uh, cross motions for summary judgment on a complex commercial dispute. And um, each side uh, has raised a number of issues and they've presented their own record. They are citing literally the same documents and they are citing literally the same depositions. And I have a, you know, a record, you know, it's that, that high and trying to sort through what each side is saying is just, uh, it's a, not the best use of, of my time or my clerk's time. Um, so I, I think a single set of documents, I mean, if you can't get along with the other side well enough to agree on a single set of documents, you got some really big problems. Yeah, I, com I completely agree with that. Uh, from the perspective of, of an appellate judge, nothing is more annoying to me than when I'm reviewing a summary judgment record and like there's um, four different places in the record where one single deposition is. There's like two pages here, two pages there, two pages. It's like, I, I, I'm trying to, <laughs> you're making it very difficult for me to review when, when it's like, so getting together and coordinating on the record is actually quite important from the appellate perspective too. Uh, but Judge Nepp, I wonder if you could comment, um, do, you, do you see the same thing, um, too many issues? Or yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> I'll let you behind the wizard's curtain here just a little bit. It's gonna be a, a pretty rare day when that 11th ground in support of your summary <laughs> judgment motion hits, okay? Um, but um, what Mark Twain said, not too many souls get mm. saved after the first 10 minutes of the sermon or something like that. Um, you gotta, but it's scary, okay? I used to be a lawyer, I love lawyers. Uh, I always tell litigants, uh, I used to be a lawyer and I, uh, at some point I wasn't fast enough to run on the first base anymore and then now they make me stand behind the plate and call balls and strikes and that's okay. But you just gotta, you, you gotta have enough confidence to pick out the winning issue or issues and, and roll with them. And it, as lawyers were so risk averse, so, oh my God, what if, I, what if I don't make the right argument? Well, if you make seven wrong arguments, all you do is is create noise that, you know, it's sort of like you flood the whole stage as opposed to putting a spotlight there I am with another analogy, but but you just you know you need to you need to spotlight, and, and I'm amazed how many lawyers don't. The great lawyers do, okay? You know you know why why did you write a 20, 20 page brief? Why well, didn't have time to write a ten page brief, right? Yeah. So th there's an art to it, and you know teach your young teach the young people in your firm, you know edit their stuff. Don't let them leave that extra junk in there because you're not. Well, they've already written it. I'll just no. Somebody's gonna have to read that, okay? And it takes it takes away from from your best arguments if you if you just if you throw everything in there. I, so I I fairly routinely grant motions for extensions of the page limits, but I I feel sorry for no. the people asking for it. 
because it, it just tells me that they didn't care enough to, 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 to pull out the right issues. So, so th this is another place where I respectfully but strongly disagree yeah. with uh, yeah, my know. colleague here. I, I do not appreciate those motions and I rarely grant them. So do not ask. You can take an extra, and, and especially do not ask the day before the brief is due. That is uh, guaranteed to uh, result in a denial. Uh, I wonder if, uh, Judge Calabrese, you mentioned um, in, in, in the process of too, too many um, uh, issues, uh, uh, the, the word developed. Uh, and I've actually noticed that quite a bit too, where I think the party has adequately preserved an argument at a very high level of generality. But I, I guess how common is it that they anticipate the judge to do most of the work? So, so I could give an example of um, a, a recent case involving the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court has now developed, in addition to a reasonable expectation of privacy test, a trespass theory, like the, the before reasonable expectation of privacy, um, kind of uh, what, what was the kind of traditional state law view on when a, a search occurred, um, and, and um, a, 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 citing the case that developed that theory, which is Jones, the GPS case, and then just say, oh yeah, under the trespass theory, it also qualifies as a search, see Jones. And it's a completely different, it's a completely different uh, area. So, okay, yeah, the, the, the court has seemed to rejuvenate the trespass theory, but can you give me something for what trespass law would look like in this new area rather than just citing Jones, which kind of preserves it. So then I have to figure it out on myself. Uh, I wonder how, how common this is uh, that, that arguments are just undeveloped and it forces the district judge or the district judge's clerks to um, do basically all the, the, the parties work for them. And kind of what's your perspective on that? What do you, what do you think should be done in response? Is, is it a forfeiture rule or, 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 or questions like that? So. Well, yeah, so um, that is a very real issue. It's one that comes up pretty regularly, and, and it ties back into the discussion uh, this morning about state constitutional law issues as well. Usually, uh, my time on the state court bench, those were never raised uh, with one or two exceptions, and certainly at about the level of generality you're describing. Um, I do think parties expect the court to do their work for them, but, but my view, Frankly, it, you know, having practiced law, um, I'd, I'd like to think at a reasonably high level for a long time. Uh, lawyers have an important job to do, and it's your job to do it. It's not my job to do it for you. You need to work with your clients uh, to counsel them, advise them of their risks, and make decisions and present their arguments for them, and to work with the other side in presenting the record and, and the issues and the arguments that you want and need. It's not my job to do that for you. If you if you give me two paragraphs on why uh, this, this race judicata argument, for example, applies, and that's all you give me, citing a uh, 1860 uh, Ohio Supreme Court decision, that's what I'm gonna give back to you. So that probably doesn't make your job any easier. Well, the problem is, what do I do with it? Do I, I have I, to, because well, if it's preserved, that's, that's the tricky part for me, is just if it's preserved, I feel like I have to, and it seems totally unfair to sandbag the district court because you, um, and I, I guess maybe my, my, my analogy would be that's what people often do to me at the Supreme Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, I did, but, but if they have preserved it, it's, it's, it is a tricky question. I mean, one, one thing I do, or, you know, not in every case, but I, uh, in a reasonable number of cases, I am having oral arguments on dispositive motions, and I do ask those kinds of questions. So, you know, are you, are you uh, raising this Fourth Amendment issue? Are you raising this uh, race judicata issue or what have you? And I ask people, all right, well, what does that look like? What's your best authority on that? And a, a lot of times, actually, people say, though not in these words, if you practice law, you, you understand the lingo for my client wanted me to make that argument. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm not really standing on that. Yeah, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Knapp, I wonder, um, so this is the Federal Society, um, originalism, textualism type arguments are um, kind of the bread and butter for lots of judges who have been recently confirmed. How, how uh, well do parties brief these types of issues? Is this an um, under, underdeveloped area of, of briefing in the district courts, uh, or are they adequately recognizing the new judges and actually briefing textualist and originalist arguments. No, they're not. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. I, mean, I, I, did, I did have uh, the, 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 the 
the uh, as a magistrate judge on a consent case, I did uh, I did invalidate a municipal ordinance as being violative of the Ohio Constitution, and there was clear federal authority that it didn't violate the. <laughs> The, the, the U.S. Constitution, but it was a case where the Ohio Constitution is more protective of property rights uh, than the federal Constitution is. And so these fellows were, uh, and ladies, were smart enough to, to make that argument. And uh, by God, if it didn't work. So, you know, kudos to them. But it's, it's, it's rare. I mean, but, but you know, we don't, we don't get that many issues of, maybe, maybe I'm over, I don't see that many fun issues it's it's, it's it's a little more of a grind so I, I maybe I you know my based on my three months on the bench or something it's uh, is a district judge it might be a little premature to be throwing everybody under the bus on that but but so far <laughs> I, I've not been scintillated that much with originalistic thought okay so. has, has that has that been uh, your perspective too judge Newman or do you uh, it hasn't happened yet, but I take those issues very seriously. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a reason I'm a member of this group, uh, <clears throat> and I will I, I adhere very strictly. To, I also believe the the role of the judge, following up on uh, Judge Calabrese's comments, is a limited role. We really are umpires. That's what we are. I don't think it's the judge's role, as an example, to getting back to the prior discussion, to do briefing on summary judgment. I mean, you raise the issues, and I decide them. That's my limited role. Um, so it troubles me when people try to expand that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Um, well, uh, w let's transition a little bit. I think uh, we're going to save at least 10 minutes of time. I, did, I don't know what time. I think we started a little late, so we may have to run five, 10 minutes over. OK, um, uh, let's talk about um, pandemic related issues and how you've how you've handled that. Um, I, I guess I'm curious on two questions, um, how, how um, criminal cases have uh, worked. Uh, Judge Newman, I, I guess I'll start with you. In, sure. in the Southern District of Ohio, how have you uh, been able to handle criminal cases with the um, uh, pandemic. And the second question is, um, I assume that a lot has, has been done by Zoom. And I'm curious if you think uh, Zoom is going to be here to stay and in what capacity? So these are great questions. Uh, these are the questions of the day. I find this topic just absolutely fascinating. So under the CARES Act, the law fundamentally changed. Um, and you are, as a judge, are allowed to do uh, criminal matters by uh, by video, by Zoom, by GoToMeeting. Our court uses GoToMeeting, which were never allowed to happen before under the Sixth Amendment. It's a fundamental change. Uh, and you're required to ask the defendant, have you had a chance to talk about this issue with your lawyer? Do you wish to have more time to talk about it with your lawyer? No, judge, I'm good. Uh, do you consent to proceed by video this morning? And say, yes, judge, I do. Okay. And then we proceed. Uh, I. I have some serious reservations about Zoom, although I wonder if it might be here to stay, quite frankly. Uh, and the reservations are uh, that people are in different rooms and they can't talk to each other. So you have a defendant in a jail cell somewhere, sometime in a county jail, sometimes in the marshal's cell in the federal courthouse, and their attorney is in their office 50 feet or 50 miles or another part of the country away, and they can't talk to each other. Uh, I take due process very seriously, so in every single case, I say if at any time, if at now or at any time of this hearing, you want to talk to your lawyer, I will jump off, my law clerks will jump off, everyone will jump off, and you can take as long as you want to chat with your lawyer. I'm not sure what else I can do, quite frankly, to, to, to give them that opportunity. I take that, that issue very, very seriously. And what's interesting is a number of these cases I know, particularly uh, in the plea bargain arena, because it's a provision in the plea, are never going to go to the Sixth Circuit because then frequently they waive the right of appeal. And so I think in that case, I'm both, in some senses, the trial judge. I'm also, it's kind of strange to put it this way, but I think I'm the, almost the court of appeals that have to triple, double check that there is due process, that the system's working the way it's supposed to work because there is going to be no appeal. There really is no one looking over my shoulder. Thank goodness that I clerked on the Sixth Circuit and I take these issues very seriously. So that's my soapbox, forgive me. But, but, but I wonder if, I really do wonder if um, Zoom is going to be here to stay. There is an effort around the country uh, to, for this discussion to ask Congress, uh, and I know that because I know the Federal Bar Association has been asked what their position is on this issue. I was national president some years ago. Uh, does the Bar Association nationally want, want the CARES Act to be continued, or do they want it to end when the, when the pandemic presumably ends? I think if it continues, it might be a substantial change in how things are done, quite frankly. So let me go back and talk just very two seconds about being a magistrate judge. 
when you're a magistrate judge, a pre-pandemic, you would meet with the, the, uh, the defendant in person. The marshals would bring them to your courtroom. You would advise them of their rights. You would appoint counsel for them. And they would sit there and talk in person. And if there's an interpreter, because they speak whatever language they speak, the interpreter would be there. And they would all meet in a group. And I'd say, do you want to have time to talk? I'll leave. And they would talk and they would confer. I question how much that's happening now on Zoom, although I'm afforded the opportunity for that to happen. But just think when you add the extra level of the interpreter, the interpreter's in the third room. You have the defendant here, the defense counsel here, the interpreter there, and you hope that they're able to, to talk. It troubles me, it concerns me, to be honest with you. I will also say, is getting too much in the minutia and the weeds here, so forgive me. In our court, uh, we are under severe funding restrictions, I was told just this past week, with the U.S. Marshals Service. Uh, we are apparently the sixth most, Southern District, most underfunded in terms of the Marshal Service in the United States of all the 90, 94 districts. That's troubling. So I know what's going to happen. We're going to get pressure. Let's do things by Zoom because the Marshals don't have to use the resources to move prisoners around. So I, I see where this is going, quite frankly, and I understand the economic constraints. I, I personally think it's better when it's done in person. I think that's how the system is designed. Just like Judge Calabrese is saying, well, the system is a trial system. We're supposed to be having trials. You know, mediation is alternative dispute resolution. So I think, for me, criminal matters should be done in court. That's the process. That's how it's designed. That's how it should work. Uh, I'm hoping we return to that. But I understand I may not get the deciding vote on that issue. but. Judge Calabrese, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, any additional thoughts you have on that and also just in a civil case, if parties want to have a hearing, are you going to be susceptible to just having a Zoom hearing rather than having them fly in or do you yeah, think so actually having them come in is good? Sure. So a couple of <laughs> thoughts. First on the criminal side, especially in state court, since the ramp up in, in the federal criminal docket has been a little slower, but in state court, uh, with the remote technology, I did hearings every which way you can imagine, where everyone was remote to uh, some people were in person and some were remote and the like. Uh, and on the criminal side, I have a very strong uh, uh, preference uh, for doing everything in person, or at least having the defendant in person in court for sentencing. Um, I, I think you need that for them to take it seriously. Um, I had very bad experiences sentencing people remotely. I, I think it undermines the process and what's supposed to happen in it. And it's just, it's just not as effective. Um, the, one, the one change that I may keep as a result of it is I started it in state court um, and I've continued it now and I may continue it for the indefinite future is um, I'm combining the uh, change of plea and sentencing into a single proceeding. Uh, you know, typically you do one change of plea hearing and then uh, so several months later, a sent separate sentencing hearing, um, but, but doing them separately. It raises a few logistical issues, uh, that, um, but I think they're manageable. You, you may tell me they're not, and um, I'll, I'll have to adjust, but um, I, you know, that's one thing I'd like to, to carry forward. On the civil side, um, I'm certainly open to it. I guess my experience uh, has been this, I, I'm, I'm curious to talk to folks uh, either in Q&A or afterward, but my experience perhaps counterintuitively has been I've taken testimony and done oral arguments uh, over Zoom uh, you know, over the last 14 months now, and I, I find taking testimony okay. I, it, that works reasonably well. Um, it's, it's not ideal. I, I think there are some credibility determinations that are a little bit harder to make and the like, but if you're trying to up fundamentally get information, I think it works. I find oral argument to be very difficult and challenging over Zoom. Uh, and maybe, maybe from the appellate standpoint, you have a different view of that, but I find the give and take to be much harder. Um, so I, I prefer to do that in person, but I continue to do that both ways. But I, I do think going forward, Zoom is going to be a, a tool, uh, or any remote technology for that matter. It's one tool among many, and like any tool, it can be used properly and effectively. Uh, or abused or overused. Um, but just as one example to your specific question, uh, the case I mentioned earlier, the, I had this discovery issue yesterday where the lawyers hadn't talked yet. I continued that out for two weeks, and I'm gonna do that discovery conference uh, two weeks from now uh, on the record over Zoom, just because I don't think it, it's gonna be short, it's gonna be about 20, 30 minutes, I think. I think we can all just jump, jump on, make a short record, and, and then jump off, so. 
Yeah, uh, so the, uh, my wife told me that the president asked fifth graders what they liked about Zoom learning. And um, one response was, if you don't know the answer, you can just pretend like there's a Zoom difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if lawyers are, would take that approach <laughs> and or argument. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I guess the one, the one thing I should add, um, uh, the, the, the one thing I would, there's only one circumstance under which I would even contemplate a jury trial over Zoom, and I, I, do, I know there have been some around the country and even, I think, in our district. Um, but that is if the lawyers in a case um, conferred and then jointly approached me and said, look, we want the trial date, and we think this is what we need to do to get it. Uh, in that world, I'd be willing to entertain it, but I have very serious concerns about having jurors uh, over Zoom. Judge Knapp, if you have anything else to add? So um, I hate Zoom and criminal <laughs> matters. Um, and this is going to sound a little imperialistic. And those of you who know me know that isn't really a word that's used often to describe me. But I think in federal court, when somebody crosses the threshold, because it's not uncommon for somebody to have a distinguished career in state court, but it's something a little different when you come to federal court in terms of you know the, the statutes and mandatory minimums and the guidelines and it's it's just a different place and i think um you know even bringing them over for that initial appearance or arraignment it sort of um it, it sets the stage that they are somewhere else now and i think we lose that in zoom because it's no different being you know in the united states district court as it is being you know, frankly, in the mayor's court in Pemberville or something. I've made that up. I don't know if there is one. But, but as a practical matter, I, I think there's something to be said for that. The other thing that is really lost with the Zoom is, at least in my, in my world, for the last 10 years and now, before I ever go on the record in a criminal case in, in, for anything, the lawyers, both sides, and the probation officer or the pretrial services officer all sit around my conference table and we talk. Okay, what's going to happen in, here in a couple minutes? What are you going to say? What do you? And we solve so many problems that if somebody was hit with it on the record out in open court, they would react differently. But if they have a moment to reflect about it, so examples of you know the government opposing pretrial release. Well, if they oppose it, then I got to have a detention hearing. If they're sitting in my chambers and we talk through why pretrial release makes perfect sense here, um, they may consent to, the, to me following the pretrial services or, or Judge Clay following the pretrial services officer's recommendation. And that saves a lot of time. So I miss that and we don't have that. So um, I, I hate Zoom in criminal matters. In civil matters, I think to some extent, it's probably here to stay as an accommodation to people, but I've been a telephone guy anyway. So, but, but anything where it's, where it's real and substantive, that I, I can't wait till we get back to in person because it just, it's just not as good. Now that said, the, the last thing, and I, I said one thing, I choose Zoom over socially distant in person. I'd rather talk to somebody through a TV screen than at the other end of the conference table where we're both wearing bank robber masks, okay? Because that does nothing to move the ball forward for me. So if, 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 if it has to be socially distant, now I'm not, you know, we, we haven't brought back hugs yet, but if you're gonna be, if we're gonna take our masks off and we're gonna, we're gonna talk to each other without hiding behind masks. So if we're gonna be a person. Great. Uh, well, that's. Um, I think we're about out of time. If anybody has uh, questions, feel free to come to one of the microphones or raise your hand. Um, yes, go ahead. Yes, um, now that you're baby judges, <laughs> is there another district judge who you regard who's been there for a while, district level judge, as a great mentor or example? I'm happy to jump in on that one. In our court, we actually get assigned a mentor. Uh, Tom Rose, Judge Rose, is my mentor someone I've loved working with for better part of a decade. Uh, we talk two times, three times a day just to check in with each other. We were doing that before, but we're doing it more now. Um, and I check in with him before sentencing. And I just think it's one extra set of eyes. I like him a lot. He's a good person. Uh, he's got very good, uh, from my perspective, very good judgment. And he follows the law very carefully. So to Tom Rose, Judge Rose is, is my mentor. My two are dead, so it's a little different me means of communication. Uh, but I'm just saying, all right? But um, 
my colleagues, we have a pretty collaborative relationship and probably one of my best friends is, is my, the other active judge in Toledo. And I was telling somebody earlier today, I'm pretty sure if we still had to punch, you know, the, the dangling Chad ballots, you know, where you punch the hole in the thing, if you held his ballot up and my ballot up to the light, you wouldn't see a dot, okay? Because we're not, we're not voting for the same things. But a lot of judging, um, we see things more similar than you might imagine, you know, things like uh, uh, what sentence should be or, or an issue on a motion to suppress. It, it, we talk to each other that way, but, but truly the, the way I conduct myself, my, my, my stylistic mentors, if you will, were Judge David A. Katz in Toledo and Judge John Potter, who I clerked for, and they were both sort of giants in the Toledo legal community. and. Rarely a day goes by that I, I don't think about something one of them said or did. So, so I guess I uh, approach this the same way I approached uh, mentoring when I was in practice. I never had like one more senior lawyer that I attached myself to. I worked with a lot of different lawyers um, on a lot of different kinds of matters and learned, you know, that this piece from this person and that piece from from that person. I, I would say my approach on, on the bench, both state and federal, has been very similar to that in, in that there are a lot of people I talk to fairly regularly and, um, uh, you know, helps me on some, you know, substantive decisions, but also just, you know, some other, you know, background knowledge and things like that. And I often check multiple places uh, to get different views and then try to figure out what, what's going to work best for me. But there's a, there's a whole lot of people um, in, in, in that from, a, from a, a range of different courts, both within the district and, and without. So I would, I would say, if I can answer it just from the circuit level, um, Judge Sutton, I don't know if he's here, so I think he's left us, so I can make fun of him and, and thank him at the same time, but I, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, uh, called him. Just, I think it's really important, frankly, just to hear from other, other judges and get their perspectives, because he's been on the bench for, I think, 17 years now, maybe, just had his 17th. Um, so I really appreciate all the help he has provided. You mean Chief Judge Sutton? Chief, oh, that's right, Chief Judge Sutton. Well, he's not here, so. Um, he told me to say that, he told me to say that. <laughs> any, any other questions? Judge Batchelder. It's not exactly a question, it's more of something that might be useful to the three new judges, but there's something in it maybe for everybody who's sitting on the platform. When I was a new judge, a new district judge, I had come up from the bankruptcy court and my mentor, uh, John Manos said to me one day, you must never be concerned about being reversed by the Court of Appeals. That's their job, to catch your mistakes. But one of my dear colleagues recently from the bankruptcy court said, oh hell, I'd always rather be right than be affirmed. <laughs> Great, any, any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well thank, thank our three panelists for taking the time to be here today.